Good afternoon to everyone. We are now live with this afternoon session, but we are going to allow a few minutes for um, the participants to join us and we will be starting shortly. So just we wait another minute and then we can start not to be too late and others will join us as we go along. Okay, I suggest we start. First of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon in this second uh, session in a um, series of webinars of getting ready for Brexit. I think it's uh, something that we've been hearing for quite a long time. It's been a very long process, but we are really now at the end of it. And um, we would like to make sure that everyone is prepared uh, for what is uh, to come as from January, as you know, um, the negotiations are still ongoing between the UK and the EU, however there's no agreement yet and therefore it is of the utmost importance to prepare for any eventuality, even that of no deal and um, as we are less than seven weeks away it's of course very important to have preparations done, information gathered, contact points known so that anyone who has a question even in these dying days, um, they are able to reach out and obtain the information they require. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Daniel De Bono. I'm the head of the uh, Malta Business Bureau's uh, Brussels representation office. We are the EU support and advisory office of the Malta Chamber and the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association. And uh, today I am thankful to have been invited by the Malta Chamber to uh, moderate this event, which as you know, will be focusing on human resources and um, employment issues related to Brexit. It's uh, the second, as I mentioned, in a series of four webinars. The first one earlier this week uh, related to issues of customs and international trade. And after today, there will be two other events on standards and the last event will be on VAT, fiscal issues, and company law. And I'll give you more information about those uh, towards the end of uh, today's event. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank, of course, the Ministry for Foreign and European Affairs, particularly the European Co Union Coordination Department for collaborating with the Chamber in the organization of this event, but the Brexit campaign in general. Uh, you will have followed in the news the campaign that was launched last week, and in fact, aside from uh, these webinars, a, a comprehensive document has been compiled covering all aspects and all sectors that will be impacted by Brexit. 
and this document, I'm informed, will be distributed and sent to the offices of all members of the Malta Chamber, so you will be receiving that uh, very shortly. Um, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have uh, four speakers. First of all, I welcome Mr. Glenn Mikalev, who is the head of the EU Secretariat and Brexit Unit at the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. We also have Ms. Rita Compton, who is a manager at the Citizenship and Expatriates Affairs Department at the Identity Malta Agency. We have Mr. Mario Schwireb, who is the head uh, of the Job Seeker Services Division at Jobs Plus, and Mr. Philip Vella, who is a head at the National Commission for Further and Higher Education, who will also be talking to us about professional qualifications. But once, one at a time, we'll start with the introductory remarks by Mr. Mikalev uh, for this event. Glenn, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Daniel. And I would like to thank, reciprocate the message of thanks to the Chamber of Commerce uh, for helping us facilitate these, these consultation sessions and get the message across more clearly. Uh, because as you mentioned, uh, this is a process that has been going on for, for a while now, at least since 2017, there's been uh, negotiations. And even before that, there was the vote in, in 2016 uh, in the referendum. Um, so so I'd, I'd like to start my, 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 my address today by uh, possibly trying to clarify a bit the, the situation we're in right now, because negotiations, as you rightly mentioned, remain ongoing, and they're ongoing as to what type of, of uh, rules or regulations will, will govern the relationship between the EU and the UK post the end of a, a transition period. Now, colleagues or, or people who might be listening today might be saying, listen, there was this kind of negotiation a year ago, so why are we speaking about no deal again right now? What we were discussing up until very late last year was the withdrawal agreement. So the divorce between the European Union and the United Kingdom. That created the opportunity to have a transition period. So a period during which the United Kingdom would continue to be treated as if it were for all intents and purposes, a member state of the European Union, with all the rules being applicable to it and it implementing them, obviously. But legally, it isn't a, a European Union member state. And that gave us a bit of a cushion within which to discuss what happens after, what happens post the 31st December. Now, the temptation from people who might be listening, uh, the first temptation would be to, to assume that this period could be extended and, and that we'd, we'd see another extension like we've seen in the, in the negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and, and, and the, 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 the cutoff date to be pushed further down the line. In this case, that is not possible. And it's not possible because when we negotiated the withdrawal agreement, we had explicitly put in a date uh, of, of the 31st December with an option for the UK to, to ask for an extension by July of, of 2020. And the UK opted not to, to, to activate that clause. So an extension this time round is unfortunately not possible. The situation is somewhat comparable to what we had a year ago when we were preparing for an OD. With the difference that some of the concerns we had related to people and the movement of people that would happen until the end of the transition period, until the end of the transition period, no longer exists because the, the withdrawal agreement covers that in its entirety. So when we as a government are preparing for this, we have that peace of mind that the, the workers, the, the people who would have moved to Malta until 31st December of this year will be covered uh, and, and will have a, a, a legal status that provides them sufficient guarantees uh, even post that date. So, and I think that, that 
should uh, be, be a positive message that we need to highlight from this process. The movement that happens after the, the end of, of the transition period will be regulated by a whole new set of rules and in which member states would have some flexibility. But the message that I would like to get across to, to the audience and to people following this session today is that there are some preparations that government has made and that it continues to make, but there are some other preparations that need to be made by private individuals, by workers, by companies who have UK nationals employed with them um, to make sure that they're fully ready for the end of the transition period. And one of them is in, in, in the area of, of citizens' rights. I'm, I'm pleased to see that, that we have colleagues from, from Identity Malta and from Jobs Plus. I know that Identity Malta has done a very good job in, in, in preparing and has been receiving applications from UK nationals and workers who have been resident in Malta so far um, and, and are registering their residence. Um, this should give them also the possibility to continue to enjoy free access to the labor market here uh, without any uh, additional additional requirements. But I will leave my, my colleagues from Identity Malta and Jobs Plus to elaborate on that. The withdrawal agreement also covers issues related to professional qualifications and the pros in case the process of recognition uh, of a UK professional qualification in the area of regulated professional would have started by the end of the transition period and perhaps Philip would be able to elaborate on that. So that's about it from my end and thank you for once again for, for organizing this session, Daniel. Well, thank you, Glenn, also for guiding us as to where we stand at the moment. And of course, these are uncertain times. We are not, um, at least from our side, perhaps you know a bit more than us, but we are not previous to what's going on with the negotiations. We know that still this week they're, they're, they're discussing. Um, uh, time is running out, essentially, because we know that there is a need for a ratification process, not just an agreement. So hopefully uh, we have more clarity uh, as quickly as possible. But from our end, what we can do yeah. is obviously prepare. Then, uh, yes. if, if I, I, will, I was just in another session before this and I was asked whether uh, I was positive on, on whether there'd be an agreement or not. Um, and I will give you the same answer here. I'm, I'm cautious, but the fact that there are some movements uh, on, on some of the major areas which were points of contention, like fisheries, is encouraging. What I can tell you is that the position of, 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 of the government and of other member states around the negotiation table is that irrespective of whether we manage to have a deal with the United Kingdom that is comprehensive, that goes beyond trade by the end of the year, uh, the, there needs to be a relationship with, with the UK because it's a major uh, trading partner. It's a partner when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to, to security issues. So whether it's by the end of the year or after that, uh, there will need to be some kind of agreement. Uh, and uh, to complement what you said, whether there's agreement or not, uh, things are going to change. So they will not stay as they are today and therefore preparations need to be made. And uh, we hope that through events like this, we are able to communicate as much as possible what needs to change um, after, after January. First of all, um, I'd like to mention that any comments or any questions that the audience would like to pose to any of our speakers, you can do so by using the Q&A um, tab. Don't write questions in the chat, please, because uh, I would not be able to follow that. But I invite you to write questions or comments in the Q&A tab of, of, of your screen. Um, let me first invite uh, Ms. Rita Compton uh, from Identity Malta to guide us a bit what the procedures will be for uh, those UK citizens residing in Malta to be able to continue doing so um, in, a, in, a, in a formal and compliant way. Rita. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rita Compton. I work at Identity Malta Agency. I am in charge of the implementation for the citizens' rights featuring the withdrawal agreement. Um, as you all know, the agreement establishes that UK nationals and their family member, once they have resided in Malta on the basis of their rights as EU nationals, will continue to do so and enjoy the same rights stipulated by the agreement. 
um, when they acquire such beneficiary state, they would enjoy indefinitely, provided that they continue to satisfy the conditions that are required. Our agency launched this campaign last year in order to disseminate such information. Together with the British High Commission, we even had talks and uh, we attended some formal meetings with them. Information is also available at, on our website for more guidance. In fact, we were one of the first member states who started accepting the applications for the withdrawal agreement, residence document, even though we were not obliged to do so before the end of the transition period. In this way, they will have, they will be exempt from their passport to be stemmed at the time of entry and departure in the Schengen area. In order to facilitate the process, we reached out to all UK citizens in our database, according to their residential location, with the application which was sent to them by land mail and the time frame to come at our offices and submit their application. This process will be ready by the end of this week. And we had quite half of the turnout. It was around 44% of the applicants that were registered in our database who came to our offices and submit their application. We will have an extension for a month for those persons who are not able to come during the time frame given in their appointment. I can say that the, the process was a smooth one, it's just only some small issues which were dealt with on case by case basis. And as from the 1st January, UK nationals who do not hold such beneficiary status would lose the free movement right and may enter the Schengen territory without, with the requirement of a visa. But if they want to enter, they can do so, but not more than 90 days in a 180-day period. This was established by the EU regulation amended, which will be in the visa legislation which will come into the force on the 31st of December 2021. Member states were given the option as to whether they would require the mandatory application to be submitted and Malta decided to apply such obligation. Therefore, if UK citizens will not submit their application before the 30th of June 2021, they will not be eligible to hold this residence document. All UK nationals and their dependents, even if they are non-EU nationals, are eligible to apply for this resident document, mainly spouses, children under 21 years, and family members in ascending and descending line, provided that they are dependents of the UK national. With regards to family members whose relationships predated the 31st December, such deadline would not apply, but they will have time to apply within the three months from their date of arrival. Obviously, it is not applicable for children born after this date. For UK nationals residing in Malta for more than five years, they can opt to apply for the permanent residence status, which will be clearly indicated in the residence document. They will continue to enjoy such status, even if they are outside Malta for less than five years. If a UK national is convicted of a custodial sentence for more than one year, they will lose the right of the status. Obviously, the status will be entitled to all applicants who satisfy the requirements established. When it comes to UK citizens settling in Malta during the transition period, these can submit their applications. In fact, we already are processing these applications. We started accepting these applications after their three months of residence in Malta. That is from the 1st of May. When they submit their application, they are given the interim receipt, which acknowledges the submission of the application for such document. And it also reflects their immigration position in Malta. The interim receipt is also valid for re-entry in Malta. If you allow me, I will share. I will share the interim receipt.
This is the interim receipt, the date of application, the name, the surname, the, ID, the residence card number. This is valid until the new card is issued, as you can see. Okay. Well, um, I, it doesn't mean that the number of registered persons in our database are effectively residing in Malta. In fact, we had a lot who had brought the Maltese citizenship, so they failed to apply or did not register as they left Malta. We received around 400 new applications at our offices, some of which were already in Malta but did not have a residence card, even children. They were in Malta, they never had a residence card, so the 400 did include that number. The residence document is now being issued in the uniform format established by the European Union regulations with a validity period of 10 years and valid for entry and exit in the Schengen area. It indicates the withdrawal agreement at Article 50. For persons in Malta more than, for more than five years, permanent residence is clearly indicated as well. You can see the document that the specimen that we are mm -hmm. this is the normal document for residence Article 18, Article 50, Article 18 of the Withdrawal Agreement. For residents in Malta, living here for less than five years, this one. This is the back of the card. Clearly indicates the country as well. And the other document is for those on permanent residence, this one. It is the same with the acceptance that permanent residence is shown on the card. The front of the card, the back of the card. And with regard to the post scenario for after the 31st of December, the end of the transition period, the government has announced that those UK nationals sent to the Malta post 1st January 2021, provided that they would be here for a purpose, that means like employment, etc. They are subject to all required immigration processes applying to third country nationals, but these will be granted. A, a, a residence permit valid for 10 years. Further details what rules will be implemented will be given in due course since discussions are still in progress regarding how they are going to pay if they need an employment license every year but license and payments will be the same as third country nationals but we will be announcing further details in due course for how this is going to be implemented as from first january Thank you, Rita. We actually okay. have um, a question uh, posed by David Atzopard in our Q&A. Um, it is basically asking if British nationals applying for the first time during this transitory period have to submit the application personally or if they have to book for an appointment prior to presenting themselves at Identity Malta. It's because they were advised that they have to make an appointment. However, uh, a confirmation was never provided. The appointments are done via Brexit email. They will, we will be sending a calendar invite. 
If he has any further questions, he can contact me on my government email. If you want, you can give him, I can give him maybe afterwards my government email, but the Brexit email to receive around 250 emails a day. And we try to respond as soon as possible. But that's how the process, they, they need to provide the proof of settlement before they get an appointment. That's very important. Without the proof of settlement in Malta, they will not be given an appointment. They have okay. to be in Malta because you need that three months period. If they do not provide the proof of settlement, it could be the boarding pass or the flight tickets or the rental agreement. Anything that shows that they are in Malta. And from that day on, we will give them an appointment after the three months of living here. Very good. Uh, what, what I suggest for David, uh, also who would like some follow-up information, get in touch um, with, with the chamber and we'll provide you um, the contact details to, to come directly to you at, at uh, the meeting. Contact my personal email if you want. Sure. And we have another question. First of all, I invite our, our uh, participants to write to us in the Q&A uh, tab, not in the chat, please. But I noticed there is a message that came in the chat. It's asking, what does it mean to have permanent residence uh, they're not understanding the difference, I think, to perhaps something you have already alluded to in your presentation. He, said, he says, does it mean that it is not restricted to 10 years and permanent, permanent residence is therefore um, more like uh, a long, longer term? And if the cards are not being processed, then the shield. So the cards are being processed and the shield. That's from the middle of October. The permanent residence status can be applied after living in Malta for more than five years. If they are living in Malta for five years, they can apply for the permanent residence. Which, which means that they will no longer have to apply for a, a residence again, right? Yes, they or, do. Or have limited they time. Still, the card is still valid for 10 years, even, even on permanent residence status. The okay. card is still valid for 10 so years. So after 10 years, they will still need to reapply. Yes, they still need to apply, but their next time application will be without supporting documents. That's the difference. If, if I can add to that, yes, please. they would need to apply to renew the document because the documents from time to time, they would need changing even because of certain security features, yes. for example. But the permanent residence does give some further flexibility to beneficiaries. For example, if one were to have permanent residence after having resided here for five years, the period with the, the period, the permissible period um, that would be allowed for one to be absent from Malta and not lose the status would, for example, be a, a bit longer, a bit, a bit lengthier. It can be less than five years. Exactly. Whereas if, someone doesn't, away from Malta. The, whereas if someone doesn't have the permanent residence, that period is, is of two years. Rita, I, I'm, Something I'm like ready. this. Okay. Thank you. We, we also have a question, but I think we could answer, I think maybe Mario's presentation may answer it, may answer it because it refers to uh, the licenses and payments uh, of, of third, third country citizens related to uh, employment uh, license, if I'm understanding well. First of all, I apologize. The, the Sun in Brussels decided to shine on, on this very day. It's not very usual, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's come out today. Okay, that's fine. So thank you, Rita. Um, uh, again, if any other questions come along, we will get in touch with you. You, you can provide them and we'll follow up later with, with the okay. participants, but uh, it's good that we uh, move on also with the uh, discussion of today because our, our time is of course limited. I'd like to invite uh, Mario Schwirep from Jobs Plus to guide us through the process of issuing uh, employment licenses for UK nationals once the UK will no longer be, well, it is no longer part of the EU already, but once the transition period will be over as from uh, January. Mario. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to share with you a very short presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, before going on to the actual uh, Brexit issue, 
I would like uh, to give you a very, very sh short uh, reminder of what services uh, the Employment Services Division provides mainly to employers, seeing that most of the, of the people online are employers. Um, so these are the services. Jobs Plus uh, registers unemployed job seekers. This includes Maltese and EU nationals, and some, uh, I will explain further on, some nationals as well. We also register people already in employment, but wanting to change the present job. Jobs Plus also provides an advisory service to job seekers, helping them to enhance their employability, thus making them more prepared for the labor market. It also provides a recruitment service for employers, which includes a personalized uh, recruitment service. Obviously, in our case, this would be free of charge. Jobs Plus is also uh, responsible for the issuing of employment license, which we will deal with later on. As Malta's public employment service, we operate URES, uh, which is a pan-European employment service. This helps employers giving exposure to their vacancies throughout the European Union. Last but not least, Jobs Plus also has a compliance unit ensuring that the labor market is run according to established laws and regulations. Although by now everybody should be aware that normally third country nationals require an employment license to be able to be employed in Malta, our compliance officers come across this type of infringement every time they go out and without fail. So at this point, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you all that the Immigration Act makes this point very clear. Third country nationals, with very few exceptions, require an employment license to be able to work in Malta. The, the relative, uh, chap the re relative uh, article in Chapter 217 is, on, is online. OK, so um, maybe it would be easier uh, at first to eliminate those who do not need an employment license. So here we are talking about Maltese nationals and foreign nationals with freedom of movement rights, that is, uh, for third country nationals basically married to Maltese nationals. EU nationals also do not need an employment license as uh, well uh, their family members. Even if their family, family members are third country nationals, they would also not need an employment license. Then there are the posted workers who do not require an employment license because they only register with the Department of Industrial and Employment Relations and uh, recognized interns. So uh, now it's time for, to focus specifically on the Brexit issue. As we all know, the United Kingdom, and we heard earlier on, uh, left the European Union on 31st January 2020. And they have a transition period ending on 31st September 2020 of this year. The United Kingdom has formally notified that the European Union that it does not wish to extend the transition period beyond the end of this year. So the cutoff date is 31st December 2020. After this date, we can say that we may have two different categories of UK citizens, those who had been residing up until 31st December, and those who will come to reside after the 1st of January. For the first category, uh, UK citizens uh, will be eligible to, as we heard from Identity Malta, to a special residence under legal notice 18 of 2020, and they will not need an employment as well as their family members. They will not need an employment license. So um, those UK citizens and their family members who are already living here and will start living here until 31st December, they can work and, and, and stay here um, without any, any problem whatsoever. 
what happens after 2021. UK nationals coming to work in Malta after the 1st of January will, like all other third country nationals, require an employment license. Initially, a single residence work permit is applied for, and this has to go through the labor market testing. Once this has been done, and subsequently, although they may be eligible for a 10-year residence period, uh, like we just heard before, they would still need to renew their employment license annually. Obviously, this is because one cannot foresee what the conditions of the labor market will be in a number of years' time. This, of course, does not exclude the possibility for UK nationals to apply for long-term residence status, which then will give them the opportunity to work here without the need of an employment license, but only if they are eligible, if they apply and they are eligible um, for the long-term residency status. I think that is all I have to say from my end. If there are any questions, uh, I will gladly answer them. Thank you, Mario. Yes, I think that there is one question which I think you have already answered, but just to be sure, um, was asking whether British nationals arriving here for employment purposes during the, transit, the transitory period, which yes. is now, whether mm -hmm. they have to wait for three months before applying or whether they can apply straight away yes. uh, for the contract of employment. If they, are, if they are arriving in the transitory period, they have to wait three months before uh, applying for a, a residency, a special residency with identity. But if they arrive now, and they start working now, they do not need anything. Because we, we are still in the transition period, and during the transition period, UK nationals do not need an employment license. So the employment license comes into effect only after the 1st of January. Okay, Rita, I'm not sure if this from your end uh, has any different implication. Um, I agree with Mario, as he stated, they can, if they come to Malta before the end of the transition period, they can register with Job Plus because they do not require an employment license until the end of the transition period. As from the 1st of January, they do require an employment license, but how it is going to be issued, they always still need more details. But uh, if they are going to settle after the 1st of January with a purpose of employment, but they will still get a residence card for 10 years, but they will need the employment license, which I, I, I don't know if it's going to be every year, but this will need to be issued according to the work at that moment, because in case of they are no longer economically active persons, they will not be ent entitled for that status. Okay. Obviously not if to I be... May add, if I may add, I mean, the fine details are still being worked out. It may exactly. not be on a yearly basis, but definitely it has, there has to be a definite time period because, yes. as I said before, we cannot foresee how the labor market is going to, uh, to react in, in the future. I mean, these are changing times, especially pandemic uh, and uh, and uh, we have to take it you know by year as it comes you see how the conditions are and then we act from, from, from. Mar mario I, I there is another question i think this is directed to you where um you're being asked whether uh, british nationals will require an employment license or a single work permit no. when they uh, in, when they come initially um, after the 1st of January, we're, we're talking after the 1st of January. It has to be a, a type of single permit because um, if they apply only for a residence permit, uh, they wouldn't be able to do that because the, the agreement st clearly states that a, a UK national cannot come to Malta to look for work from here. So when, when that UK national comes to Malta, he should have already a work you know, waiting for him. So um, on the other hand, they cannot start with the employment license because we wouldn't be able to issue an employment license unless they have a, an employment a, a residence permit. So 
in the beginning, when they first arrive, it has to be a joint application, like the single permit. All third country nationals apply through the single permit. So even UK nationals, being third country nationals after um, the 1st of January, they need to apply through a single process. Then on, on the issuing, I mean, it has to go through the labor market test. When it comes to the issuing part, the residence part of that permit would may be up to 10 years if they are eligible. But the, um, although they are getting a, a, a residence card uh, valid for 10 years, there should always be a proviso telling them that the employment part uh, has got to be renewed every so often. It could be every year, it could be every two years, uh, we'll see. But it has to be renewed every so often. Thank you, Mario. And uh, I hope that also answered the questions that we've had so far. I remind you uh, that any questions, please put them in our um, Q and A Q and A section. Very good. So I will now move to the final speaker. I think we have another fifteen minutes or so to go. So plenty of time for Philip's presentation and perhaps another few questions if there are. Uh, Philip will uh, speak to us about uh, professional qualifications. It's another important aspect related to employment. So Philip, I, I pass on the floor to you. You're still on mute, Philip. Okay. I think I, okay. Good afternoon again. So essentially, I would like to point to an initial clarification. So the professional qualifications directive is different from the MQRIC framework. I mean, the level one, two, three, and six. So that's a different framework. Here we were speaking about the professional qualifications directive, which was um, uh, approved in 2005, with which regulated professions um, can provide their professional services across the European Union. So we'll, I'm referring to that kind of framework. In Malta, each regulated profession um, has the competent authority, which is in charge for the issue and release of the warrants, licensing, or whatever is necessary, like registration for a particular provider to provide his service. So far, the Professional Qualifications Directive and the subsequent amendments proved um, a very reliable tool to have the qualifications, professional qualifications, um, the recognition process to, to run very smoothly and in a rather homogeneous and harmonized system across the European Union. However, as uh, most of the previous speakers mentioned, Brexit um, brought along, uh, is going to bring along a rather substantial, substantial changes. And I hope that I can share the presentation with you. So here we are. So essentially, to date, the, 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 we have one fact. The UK practically left the European Union. Few certainties today do with the Royal Agreement because we have written conditions and written parameters and written provisions till the end of this year, what's going to happen. However, in a post-Brexit scenario, so 1st January 2021, we might face multiple scenarios, depending also, for example, or, or if we have an agreement or not by the end of this year. So we have to brace ourselves for various um, um, options. Basic facts, so we already mentioned. So for me, 2017, this whole process was triggered. For us, from a professional qualifications, it meant that there was going to be changes. And today, three years after, we were still ironing out those, um, what will be the ultimate outcome through the ongoing negotiations process. Again, as it was mentioned before, the withdrawal agreement brought um, uh, an acceptable amount of certainty. However, it is dated, it is timed because it will, um, um, uh, the, the end of the withdrawal period um, is the end of this year. 
And by the end of the transition period, we have to brace ourselves to new realities and new treatment of UK nationalism and vice versa in the recognition of official qualifications. And then the note in the event of having a no deal scenario, um, we have to also brace ourselves for a specific treatment uh, in recognizing um, professional qualifications. So today, the PQD, I will refer to the professional qualifications directive as PQD. So the PQD to date um, provided um, a lot of certainties. However, the moment that the UK will leave the um, European Union, a lot of things will change. However, the withdrawal agreement provided for a number of, 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 of um, assurances and uncertainties. So all those UK qualifications um, or of um, irrespective of whether they belong to UK nationals or other EU nationals recognized in the EU prior to the end of the withdrawal agreement will re retain their validity even after the end of, of the transition period. So essentially, if, for an example, a doctor of medicine had his qualifications um, recognized before the end of this year, even if the, once the EU leaves definitely the European Union, the recognition process of that individual, and this applies to other regular professions, that will apply, will, will, remain, will, will, will retain its validity. Then, um, those applications that were submitted prior to the end of the transitional period, and the European Union asked all member states, including the competent authorities, of course, to process them as fast as possible. However, if someone submits an application on the 30th of December, expecting to have the recognition completed by the 31st, that might be a bit cheeky then. However, we gave instructions to all competent authorities to um, process as fast as they can the, the, the outstanding depending applications they might have, because um, till the end of um, this year, UK nationals have the right to have their um, applications processed in terms of the PQD as any other EU national. Uh, just just uh, a clarification, Philip, but uh, not just UK nationals, but even in this case, Maltese who have obtained their qualification exactly. in the UK, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Then in a post-Brexit um, scenario, um, we'll have... Um, rather some stark changes. Again, this depends from if we have an agreement or not. However, um, in this instance, we'll have the issue of third country nationals. Today, we have two major system of recognition of the professional qualifications. The directive provides for the automatic recognition of seven specific professions. We're talking of nurses, midwives, um, among them dentists, pharmacists, and so forth. There is a list of academic institutions, universities, including UK ones today. Um, and the, these professions, the moment someone attains his qualifications, one of these um, academic institutions, university listed in the directive, the moment they decide to move cross border, whatever, and need to have their qualifications, um, recognize there is an automatic process. Once we leave the European Union, this process for the UK nationals will cease. And that's one of the major changes we have. They will have to have their qualification recognized to the what's called the general system of recognition, which is uh, much more lengthy and it takes more time. It's much more cumbersome. Essentially, it's the same process which currently third country nationals, they have to go through. Um, essentially, this practically we mentioned that um, after the end of this year, unless there will be an agreement specifying otherwise, um, the principle of third country nationals will apply to, to UK nationals in the process of um, having their prof professional qualifications um, recognized. Um, again, once the UK definitely leaves the European Union, another factor, the temporary and occasional service, this is an element of the PQD where um, you might have a professional who decides to move um, cross border to provide his services. 
not to establish himself for a long time, but for a temporary, for example, three months, a short time period, or occasional for two or three times. For example, you might have a tourist guide, for example, coming over to Malta for a, a week to accompany a specific group of persons. That is um, an occasional service. All you need now, with the UK still technically benefiting from the PQD, is to send a declaration. With the UK outside the EU, UK nationals, assuming, for example, I mentioned the tourist guide, um, they cannot benefit from, from this provision of the PQD because the PQD does not apply anymore for, for, for UK nationals once the, um, the, the, the transitional period comes to, to, to an end. Another factor is there are a number of databases which are used by, by the various competent authorities in Malta. One of them is the European Professional Card. The European Professional Card caters for five major professions. I mean, it comes to my mind, um, nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists, I mean, in other countries, mountain guides, we don't have them, or estate agents. This is an online system with which um, applications are processed. The moment, we reached 1st January 2021, the UK will lose access to this um, system, of course, because um, the pure official qualifications does not apply to, to, to the UK. The internal market information system. This is a major database, but one of the elements that um, helped a lot a number of competent authorities in Malta, for example, um, those authorities involved in the health sector, for example, doctors of medicines, nurses, each time, for example, across the European Union, um, an individual active in, in these professions, a doctor of medicine, for example, or a nurse, was found in a definitive manner, found to have breached um, the law or whatever, his respective uh, member states used to upload alert for all the other member states to, 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 to take note of. One of the consequences of the UK leaving the EU is that the UK will lose that option of highlighting these, the, these, these cases. So by default, Maltese, the Maltese counterpart, for example, the Medical Council or the Council for Nurses and Midwives, um, will lose the ability to have knowledge of any UK nationals active in the one of the medical um, branches that I mean if this individual was found of some kind of mishap or whatever so they the UK will lose access to this database. Um, uh, exactly I mean these are the the, the main um, professions that benefit from the AMI to date and the UP professional card. Um, Again, we have three key um, um, scenarios in front of us. Negotiations are still ongoing. Hopefully, um, an agreement will be reached. That way, we'll have more certainties and conditions will be clearly stated in an eventual agreement. However, it is in the interest of both sides, the UK and also the EU. I mean, as rightly mentioned by some of the, one of the, um, speakers before, considering the culture and historical ties of uh, Malta with the UK, a substantial amount of individuals um, in Malta, they go to UK to for study, for specialization, especially in the health sector. So it is, um, it will be a major development if we have an agreement. So we might have an agreement and we hope so, but um, nothing is cast in stone. I mean, time is not on our side. I mean, time is really um, um, pressing on us. An extension of the transitional period is not possible. In fact, I mean, we will pass the day within which this, the, the current period can be extended. And it was also made clear by the UK government that they we're not going to ask for, for an extension of this period. In the eventuality of an old deal, then we'll have the UK leaving definitely the, UK, the EU with, a, with, with, a, with an old deal. In that case, for us, um, all UK nationals who decide to submit new um, um, applications to have their qualifications um, uh, recognized by one of the competent authorities, by the respective profession they, they targeted, they will be um, considered as third country nationals and they will 
um, be um, uh, the applications will be processed um, through the general system of recognition. Essentially, the certainties that UK nationals benef benefited from um, so far till the end of the year, thanks also to the um, transition period as provided for with the, with the agreement, will cease to 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 to, to exist. Um, essentially, um, the same thing. Um, qualifications obtained by UK EU nationals or um, obtained in the UK prior to the to the um, uh, end of this year, if they were recognized prior to the end of the day, they, again, it, they will retain their, their, their validity. However, fresh applications um, from 1st January of next year, they will be um, processed using the, the, the new um, procedure. And it also depends according to the requirements, the criteria of the competent authority in the respective member state. Um, for example, I prepared two specific examples. I mean, lawyers today through the Professional Qualifications Directive, they benefit, I mean, they had specific um, directives which regulated the, 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 the legal profession. For example, a UK national, if um, a UK uh, solicitor or barrister if decided to practice in Malta, first they had to access the, the exam bar to get a Maltese warrant. So that's granted. However, they were allowed to practice their profession using their, using their home title. Of course, they could not practice in the local courts unless they don't get the warrant, but they can retain, they were able to practice using the, um, the title, um, whatever title they had back home. From 1st January, UK nationals will lose this, 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 um, this facility because the professional qualifications um, will not apply anymore. Architects is the same thing. Article, architects, because of the professional qualifications, directive, they benefit from automatic recognition. Today, UK national and UK architect coming over to Malta had his qualification, if it was listed in Annex 5 of the professional qualifications directive, automatically recognized. The moment the UK will leave the EU, the EU and on indefinite basis a uk architect will lose this um, um this um let's call it benefit as provided by by the directive so um a lot of provisions that granted a substantial amount of rights to uk nationals uh, it, it um it they will come to an end since the PQ, the profit qualifications directive will not apply anymore for uk nationals and the UK will maintain um, similar provisions as contained in the uh, in the PQD in its relations with um, EEA um, countries. However, um, that is limited to the um, countries which, which um, make part of the European economic area at the moment. Um, again, as I mentioned, this severely impacts on the automatic recognition um, provision of, of, of the PQD. From our end, um, we participated from the earliest time when the European Union was providing the first instructions and the, was drafting the, the first plans of how it, go, it was going to deal with the um, changes that were envisaged. Um, a number of expert meetings were held in Brussels and, and a number of stakeholders were, were involved. Then from our end, we provided all information as necessary to all competent authorities in Malta, um, to liars with their respective um, members and their respective bodies to facilitate um, a smooth transition. And the nearest event, we're going to have the annual conference for all the competent authorities where we'll provide the latest information to all competent authorities um, in Malta, where they can also um, highlight or raise any issues they, they came across or issues they, 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 they think they will face and they might need further um, backup. Um, from our end, we also have uh, a generic email where we can um, receive specific queries from the general public and also from 
um, UK nationals, we receive a lot of them, and then we guide them accordingly to the various competent authorities to clarify um, any issues they might have on time, preferably prior to the end of this year, in preparation for, for um, the start of next year again. There will be substantial changes um, if we'll have an no deal. If um, a deal is agreed, we look forward to, to, to um, liars and um, have all competent authorities implement whatever provisions there might be in the most efficient manner to, to, to ensure that as Malta and also the competent authorities will implement all provisions um, on a timely manner and also in, in full for the benefit of both local Maltese citizens and also the UK nationals that might decide to uh, make use of um, or come to Malta to provide their, their services. Um, this is the latest one of the meetings we attended was uh, one of the speakers was the Viba um, CEO, I mean, the architect. In case of an agreement, I mean, the PQD guaranteed a lot of certainties for UK nationals. An agreement will put in place it, I mean, not the same amount, definitely the UK left for a reason. So, I mean, they cannot have all benefits of the internal market because here we're speaking of the internal market as a significant element of the internal market. However, um, an element of reciprocity, an element of certainty to ensure um, a fee flow as much as possible, even within limits, if they will be um, set in an eventual agreement, to ensure as, um, the flow of, of, of professions or professionals across the border between the UK to, to the EU and vice versa. So we brace ourselves for even, any eventual agreement. And if not, um, I hope that all competent authorities um, will practice and function in the most efficient manner with the provisions that we have in place and they will make good use of the preparations that they 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 um, worked hard on in the the, the, the last months um, thanks very much for your attention and i hope that um, if you have any queries whatever do contact us for 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 any clarifications and we can be of any Philip, actually there's one question which um, I'd like to take you back to um, the point you were making about the legal profession. Um, you're, you're being asked to explain uh, the, the, the impact um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what if you're, for example, working in a company's legal department, and if it makes a difference if you have a Maltese warrant or not. Uh, can you perhaps uh, clarify again that slide that you were referring to yes, about the legal are, profession if you and are, the conditions there? Yeah, how to well, work. Basically, for lies, if you are a foreign, a foreign national, not Maltese, and you manage to have the Maltese warrant, you pass the, the exam, the bar exam, and you attain the warrant um, signed essentially in Malta by, by the President of the Republic, that's how it is, you can provide your services normally if you impose a Brexit. However, if let's assume I have a hypothetical case, we speak of 1st January 2021, you have a UK national who happens to be a, a barrister or, or a solicitor, and he decides to practice in Malta, if, if he or she wants to provide their service in the law courts, there is only one way to access, to pass the, ex, the, the bar exam, and they get the, 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 the warrant. Today, um, UK nationals, uh, solicitors, whatever, or for example, an Italian, an avocado, they were allowed to, to practice under the homegrown um, home title, avocado, um, and they can provide their service at a law firm. Still, they could not provide their service in court without a warrant. And what will change with the Brexit is that UK nationals will lose the, 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 the right to use their home title. All the other EU nationals, um, Italians, whatever, they can still benefit from this facility of using um, the home title, um, rightly so, because they are still EU members. I mean, this applies only to UK nationals. 
Okay, and if there are any, I have one question to close with, but if there are any specific questions that you'd like to follow up with, Philip, uh, you can contact him directly at the, um, it's a very long name, I always forget how to say it, the National Commission for Further and Higher Education, the NCHFE. Um, my, my final question, uh, Philip, is another hypothetical question. Uh, so let's say a Maltese national obtains a professional qualification in the UK after the transitory period end. In that case, they would need to go to the process of having it recognized locally, right? If it is, if it is a, a, I would like to have the facts um, understand the fact. If it is a Maltese national who obtained his UK qualifications after the Brexit, you mean? Yes, after after December, so as, as next year. Yeah. Um, he has to have his qualifications um, processed to the general system. For example, if this happens to be um, one of those um, seven automatically recognized profession, unfortunately, um, has to go to the general system. Okay. Now, a follow-up question to that. Let's say they obtain um, the, the, this uh, certification in Malta. Is there a harmonized system then in the EU? If once it's recognized in Malta and this Maltese national wants to move abroad, and practice abroad, um, will they have to once again have it recognized in that member state? Or once it is recognized by Malta, then it, it, it's basically open to practice across the EU? Nothing will change in relation to the other EU countries, EU members. So, for example, if a, if a pharmacist graduated in Malta, let's take a concrete example from the University of Malta, and he decides or she decides to move to Italy, she or he will still benefit from the automatic recognition. The Italian counterpart of the Council for Pharmacy in Malta will look into Annex 5 of the PQD, will find the University of Malta. It is the same qualifications presented by this uh, individual in front of him, and they will grant him access to the automatic recognition. So in relation to the other EU nationals, the EU members, sorry, nothing will change in terms of PQD. So, any, um, but, but what I was referring to is Maltese nationals acquiring their qualification in the UK. Oh, in that, no, in that case, they will make them have the make, I mean, they will have the, prof, the, the qualifications recognized um, through the general system, unless they, they, they had the, the recognition um, finalized prior to the end of this year, because those who had their qualifications um, approved, recognized prior the, to the end of this year, they will retain their validity. But those who never submitted, never started that process, they have to go through the general system. Okay, and a final question, it's a follow-up question again on the legal profession. It's, it's whether um, a, a UK lawyer can still work for a Maltese company. I think the answer is yes, right? It's just that, especially uh, to the way, if their, their qualification has been recognized already, they can keep on going as normal. If, if they are going to obtain the qualification as from January onwards, then we just need to have it recognized. I mean, but they can continue working for a Maltese company. They, if they are specialized in a particular legal branch, they can, but they cannot provide the, 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 the services in court litigation, for example, right. unless they really go and get a warrant and yes. like any other uh, Maltese lawyers who graduate from the University of Malta, for example. But they can benefit from their whole title. Daniel, I, I think, and I would like to echo a point Philip made in, in his yes. first part of the presentation. It is very important to distinguish between the academic and the professional qualification. So what we're speaking about here is the warrant. And I, I think the gen what Philip said, I completely agree with. Um, uh, the general principle is that if the qualification is recognized in the EU, or is in the process of being recognized in the EU until the 31st of December, it can go on as if it is a, an EU national level. If it starts after, then irrespective of whether the person is a UK national, oh, is a Maltese national, is an Italian, is a French person, the, pers the, the process will be completely different. So I think that's the general principle of it all. And it's a general principle in other areas as well. Um, what Rita was mentioning, if someone is resident before the 31st of December and is registered here as, as resident or is in the process of registering his residence, then he will continue to enjoy the rights after. And, and the principle is always the same. I know that the, the information is, is a lot, might be a lot to take in. 
Uh, I, I once again would like to make reference to the document which we've published and which you could possibly circulate to, to all. There's all the, the helplines and the links and the, the email addresses one would have to uh, direct questions to. If, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with us after the meeting or has any specific question, uh, I'm, 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 I'm open to answer it as well. Yes, and, and in fact, sorry, yes, Philip. Number one last point. I mean, in the last month, I would like to highlight one point. We had a number of individuals, especially UK individuals, who were confusing the MQRIC process with the mutual recognition process. They applied to have their qualifications recognized through the MQRIC, the level of six, whatever. But that is different, as Glenn highlighted. You gain access to the profession through the registration, the license of the warrant. So those UK nationals, who were, already, who were already in Malta, I mean, they need to understand the distinction between um, the empiric process and the recognition process under the PQD. They are two separate processes. Very good. Glenn, is there any um, email that we can communicate here for, for follow-up questions in this regard? Uh, there is the Brexit at gov.mt. Um, there's the website um, brexit.gov.mt brexit.gov.mt which provides a link to the document covering all these areas and the different regulations that would apply and the processes that one would have to to, to, to go through in different scenarios. Yes, um, so I encourage all of the participants uh, to if they have any follow-up questions to seek more information, get in touch with the ministry uh, who, if you have very specific questions, will then guide you to who you need to contact, but you can also feel free to contact the Malta Chamber. Uh, and uh, we will also provide uh, guidance as to where best to obtain the information that you require. To close this event, first of all, I thank you once again. I thank all the speakers for having spent with, with us the past hour and for the information they shared with us. But I also thank the participants who stayed and I hope that this session was informative and helpful and answered any questions that you may have, may had. Um, I'd just like to remind you about two uh, remaining events in this series of Brexit web webinars events that uh, will take place in the coming days. On the 24th of November, there will be an event on standards. And on the 30th of November, an event related to VAT, fiscal and company law. That's regarding the Brexit side, but I was also asked by the Chamber to inform you about two other events that the Chamber is organizing. Um, on the 19th of November, it's tomorrow, in collaboration with HSBC, an event entitled Extraordinary Time Call for Extraordinary uh, Banking. And um, they will forgive me, but in the midst of all the papers I have in front of me, oh yes, here it is. On the 23rd, um, between the 23rd and 25th of November, there is a due diligence certified master class certification um, that will be taking place. But for more information about this, I invite you to get in touch directly with the chamber. So with that, I once again, thank you. I encourage you to continue getting the information before the end of December to be prepared for the changes that will take place soon afterwards. And with that, I leave you and I thank you once again, and I wish you all a good afternoon.